Welcome. Hopefully you intended to be in the EQS pre-norming session, which is empirical and quantitative skills. That's what this is. I uh, just wanted to make sure because we also have social responsibility occurring at the same time. Um, EQS is assessed in a wide range of subjects. It's probably our widest range in terms of our ILOs because um, we include core area 20, which is mathematics, core area 30, which is life and um, physical sciences, but then also core area 80, which is behavioral sciences, and that spans a wide range of things um, like geography. That's why Ryan is here. We have Bill from criminal justice, um, Patrick from economics. So we have a whole wide range of people assessing EQS, which is why the pre-norming sessions are so important. Um, let me go ahead and start sharing my screen. Um, if you registered in advance, you received um, an email from me just a little while ago with um, a resource in it. Um, I'll be posting that in the chat as well. I just know sometimes it's nice to have that ahead of time and in a different location in case the Zoom chat is giving any issues. Okay, so why do we do pre-norming? Because this is different than norming. Um, and I think that that can be a little confusing because they have very similar names. Um, Pre-norming is actually something that we've kind of invented and developed on our campus starting in 2019. The purpose for pre-norming is that we are talking and having conversations about the rubric at this first stage. So before the students even see your key assignment, before they interact with some of that content, our goal for pre-norming is looking at the rubric, ensuring that we've thought about the instructions for the assignment, see if we're asking students to do the tasks in the rubric, and that helps us make a quality aligned assignment. Well, then what happens after that? Well, we give it to the students, and if we make sure that the assignment is aligned, that means the student is giving us an artifact where they've been prompted to show these skills. So they're gonna give our their best work basically because they've been prompted to do all of these things. And why, why is that important? Because then it makes our results actually valid and more reliable, which is critical. Um, that's why we study assessment is to try and wrangle our heads around this giant concept of student learning. And that's a tricky thing to study. And that's what we're trying to do with this assessment process the best we can. And the more um, reliable artifacts that we receive, the better our results will show us how our students are actually performing. So again, the purpose of pre-norming is because we're starting at this step one, making sure that the assignment is aligned. Um, and you'll have a lot of time to chat with other people in your discipline or outside of your discipline. Um, I always like to take this time to have those rubric conversations. Um, we did update the EQS rubric, so we'll be looking at that and making sure that everybody has the correct um, version of the EQS rubric, which I have to say, shout out to the EQS revision team from a couple summers ago. I know several of you are here. Ryan, you helped on that. Lance, you helped on that. Um, Elizabeth, yeah, you helped on that. Um, I'm sure there's more. I'm just trying to remember everybody that was a part of that. <laughs> Um, and again, at the end of the day, we do all of this so that we can see our students be successful in things outside of just our content area. Um, that's another part of assessment is that THECB, the Texas Higher Ed um, Coordinating Board, has asked us to teach these larger skills outside of our content, communication, critical thinking, and then this empirical and quantitative skills. So after today, you'll feel confident enough <clears throat> to describe, hold on one second, to describe the language in the EQS rubric, you'll feel confident to align your key assignment with the instruct, um, instructions with the new EQS rubric. And even, I think most importantly, because a lot of us, there's some adjuncts on that we're able to come today, but we know that there's some adjuncts in our department that might not be able to come today. So, also being able to explain the process is really important so you can help anyone out in your department that may be struggling a little bit or at least unfamiliar with the process. So our agenda, and honestly, depending on how we go, we're probably not going to take till 11 a.m. It is my goal to get you out a little bit sooner than that. I'm not gonna tell you how a little bit, that'll be 
depending on how we have these conversations, but I am hoping to get you out before 11. Um, so we're going to be discussing the first criterion on the rubric, the second one, the third one, and you're going to be with breakout um, groups and um, I have a way to kind of lead that discussion where really our focus today is on your key assignments. So in your head, start thinking about, okay, what assignment do I give for EQS or what assignment could I give for EQS or something that I already give that's close to these rubric language. So that's kind of the conversations we're going to have to start us off after we discuss the criterions. And then we'll review the assessment process. I'll give you some links just to keep you updated. Um, I want to make sure you know when you'll be hearing from me. Um, so that way we can keep each other accountable too. Um, and then lastly, if you're interested, um, you can stay because I know some of you attended my assessment session um, during convocation. But if you're interested and you want to see the critical thinking and teamwork assessment results from last semester or last uh, year, please hang out and uh, see those. But I know that, like I said, some of you have attended the other session. So I wanted to end with that and give you the option to leave early if you're um, if you've already seen those results. All right. Any questions before we get started? Okay, we're ready to dive right in. So as I mentioned earlier, EQS is such a wide range of topics. So if you look down here, I went and found some little cheesy pictures, some clip art, you know, um, and these are some of just the representations of everything that assesses EQS. So you see the criminal justice, you see government, you see economics, we have anatomy and physiology, we have math of different types, biology, chemistry, physics, um, and even to some extent, some courses that aren't represented in the core, like computer science and engineering, they're still interested in EQS, but maybe they don't, uh, they're not asked by THECB to assess and teach it. Um, so huge wide range of topics. Um, and really because the goal of EQS, the learning outcome set forth by THECB, is that Palo Alto College students can manipulate and analyze numerical data or observable facts resulting in informed conclusions. So with that inclusion of observable facts, I think that's where it opens up the range of what can be assessed by EQS. So to start off with, I thought it might be helpful to remind ourselves what a key assignment is since we will be thinking about it moving forward in the session. And I know we have some new faculty on the call too. So a key assignment is any assignment that you already have in your course that could prompt students to demonstrate proficiency in these criteria that we're gonna look at in the rubric. So I always like to stress that it's not that, especially if you've never assessed or taught EQS before, it's not that you're being asked to create a brand new assignment. It's just to think about the assignments that you already give and see if you can adapt one to this EQS rubric. Now, in some cases that may develop into creating a new assignment, but it's not required. Think about what you're already teaching in your course. Um, it should be a regular part of your course curriculum given every semester. So that because we're teaching and assessing EQS throughout a college student's career at PAC. So it shouldn't just be this one semester, fall 2022 is the one time they get to see the EQS assignment. It should be given every semester and become a regular part of your course because you're teaching students each semester to build on these skills. And lastly, it should be completed by all students in the course. This can be a common misconception because when you hear from me later in the semester, I'm going to give you the students that are in your course that have been selected to be sampled. But that doesn't mean that the other students should not complete the assignment. I mean, put yourself in your student shoes for a second and you think you're sitting there and someone comes up to you and says, hey, here's extra work because you are you have been chosen this year um nobody's going to appreciate that and they're probably not going to do as good of a job as they would have if it had just been a normal assignment in the curriculum so please 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 make sure that you give the assignment to all of your students any questions about a key assignment amanda yeah i have yeah, a quick question so some of us, I guess many of us have uh, been working uh, using the same assignment for, you know, we have the same course. Uh, mm -hmm. It's okay to be using the same assignment, right? I mean, it's been there for a while. Uh, Definitely. You know, we, we teach this every year. Yes, Tony, as, as long as the assignment 
um, aligns with the criteria. That is really the only like, that is the only rule, I guess we could call it. Um, but as long as it aligns with the rubric criteria, you can use the same assignment year after year, especially if you find that students are performing well on it. Right, okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no, thank you so much for asking. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's uh, go ahead and start taking a look at the new criteria. Um, as I mentioned before, the rubric was updated. It used to have five criteria and now it has three. And really it still has the same information. It's just a little bit simplified or condensed is really the word we're looking for. So the first criterion is now identification. Can the students gather, identify or recognize appropriate information? And we put both qualitative or quantitative um, because of the observable facts um, part of the rubric or the definition of EQS. Synthesis, can students process, synthesize, or manipulate appropriate data or facts? And then conclusion, can they use all this information that they've gathered, that they've processed, can they turn it into a conclusion where they interpret, analyze, or explain what they've just gone through, what they've just experienced? So those are our three criteria now, identification, synthesis, and conclusion. We adapted the rubric from the University of North Texas. That was the rubric language that the committee really appreciated the most in terms of the way it was straightforward, but still gave several options depending on your subject area. Um, we also have created a new EQS glossary. Our critical thinking rubric has something similar. And please, by all means, share this with your students too. If you share the rubric with them, share this glossary with them. We developed it with the student in mind. Um, to make sure that they feel comfortable with the rubric as well. Um, so we'll get to all of these words when we look at the rubric more closely, so I'm not gonna read them all out to you. But um, yeah, take, take a second to go through this with your students too. It could be really helpful. Um, and we gave some examples in areas that it, we felt could need a little bit more information. So we'll just jump into our first criterion, which is identification. And again, at the end of the day, the goal is, can students manipulate and analyze numerical data or observable facts resulting in a conclusion? So for this particular criterion, I went ahead and highlighted the only vocabulary word that's in the glossary, which is skillfully. I'm gonna focus first on developing though. This is our outcome met um, performance level language. So if students perform and meet this particular criterion for um, EQS, that means they have successfully gathered, identified, or recognized relevant information. And we did include the word relevant in there um, in terms of relevant to the problem at hand. Um, so if you go up a level for advanced, that's really where you start to see the word skillfully, which we have defined as with great ability to do an activity or job well. So they skillfully perform exactly how they did in the outcome met. And then we added this last part. They take the information and turn it into an insightful portrayal that contributes to further, deeper understanding of the issue. So in other words, they don't just gather the information. They talk about it in a way that you can tell that um, they're making more connections. They're making deeper connections with the material. And then on the other side, the emerging category, which is outcome not met. Students who receive a one or their work receives a one means that they did not gather, identify or recognize any information or, and the committee thought that this was important too, information is irrelevant to the issue. So in other words, it's like you're reading a problem about biology, they go off into, you know, calculus, which <laughs> could have its place in time, but maybe not in that problem. So that's what we're talking about when it comes to irrelevant information. Now, one thing that comes up often is when we do our assessment process and faculty rate student work in the spring, how do faculty that are not in our discipline know what's relevant and what's not relevant? So we'll talk about that a little bit further when we um, consider the cover sheet, but I wanna just bring that to your mind just to think about how would I be able to describe to someone what is relevant? Because you would have to describe it to your students too versus the irrelevant information? How do I keep them in the track with the context? Um, 
So um, I'm going to open for questions while I start um, making the breakout rooms ready too, because what we're going to be doing next is going into some brief discussions. I have it for 10 minutes. Um, as we move on, we can decide if we need to tweak that time with more or less time. Um, but you'll be in a group of people. We'll be talking about criterion one. And specifically, the question is focus on the key assignment. Based on the language in the rubric, how does your assignment prompt students to perform? How do you prompt them to have to gather, recognize, or identify the information? So keep in mind the performance level language the most. That's the most important thing in these conversations. All right. Are there any questions at the moment while I start setting this up? Okay. All right, I have the breakout rooms ready. Um, let me show you how we'll be recording our thoughts because I think that's helpful. Um, we will be, I mean, if you've been in a session with me before, you know I love them, but they're just so easy to share information. Um, we'll be using Jamboard. I'm gonna go ahead and place the link for the first Jamboard in the chat. Maybe. And I'm gonna just kind of walk you through how to use it if you've never used it before. This is also, this link is also in um, the document that I shared with you through email. So the way you use a Jamboard, there's lots of different ways, but I think the easiest way is to use this little sticky note feature off to the left. And if you're getting into the Jamboard right now, you can play around. Um, so I'm gonna click on the sticky note. It pops up this little box. You can choose your color if you wanna get fun with it and you can type a message. Now I'm just gonna type hi, <laughs> and I'm gonna hit save, and the sticky note automatically posts off to the side and you can move it over to the other, uh, to an area where there's less clutter. So again, feel free to try that out if you want. Um, the way that we're going to do this today is that I made six breakout rooms. So there's about five-ish people, or six people in each room. Um, if you look at this bar at the top, we have numbered slides. This will correspond to what breakout room that you're in. So if you're in breakout room five, just go to slide five and leave your responses here. Because I, if we tried to do all 30 people on one slide, that would be a, that would be a bit much. Um, so again, if you're in breakout room two, you go to slide two. If you're in breakout room three, you go to slide three. Um, and then just a reminder, sticky notes are right here. You type a message and then you can click off to the side and your message will be saved. Um, are there any questions about using Jamboard before we get started? Okay, and what I would recommend is in your breakout rooms, if one of you becomes the brave person to share your screens, that way it kind of helps everyone out and look at the same place, especially if anyone's having any tech issues. All right, I think we have everyone back. I'll try that again in the next breakout room. Um, thank you. I see so many good, um, so much good stuff coming back. And again, it's so cool because, um, like I said, there's so many, there's such a variety of our courses that we teach in EQS. I just wanted to highlight this slide real quick with breakout uh, group number two. We have such a good grouping of a variety of subjects. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to share real quick. Um, and if anyone from the groups wants to share out, how does the language in your rubric um, prompt students to meet Criterion 1? Or do, do you run into any challenges with Criterion 1? Anybody want to share out? I guess for my EQS assessment, um, they, I give them a data set because it's it's a data set that's been collected by, I think, like NASA or something like that. And so, um, you know, the the part that, you know, I think I need to clarify in my assignment is, you know, graphing, if a student could select the wrong formula or the wrong graph or do something incorrectly. And so part of that is, you know, making sure that it's clear that, you know, that's part of the criterion for identifying or gathering information that, you know, um, they select the right formula or they select, you know, that they graph things um, that make sense because they could graph it incorrectly and then that that's not satisfying the criterion. I see what you're saying. And then that would impact all of their future analysis if the graph was incorrect. Yeah. Thank you for sharing, Liz. So, um, Amanda. Yeah. Um, when, when we were talking, I was 
kind of going back to a conversation you and I had had about rubrics uh, mm -hmm. pre-COVID. So it was kind of a long time ago, but um, I, I think we were specifically talking about the communication. Yeah, rubric. I think we were too. <laughs> yeah, uh, but uh, anyway, the 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 thing here is like for Criterion One, depending on how some of us the the type of assignment that we we we're doing uh i i think a lot of times it's it's implicit that the student needs to gather information and stuff because that is actually part of the assignment um and so the prompt that we give the student you know there there isn't really like a, an explicit prompt or something about gathering information or or whatever the case may be but i i think sometimes other uh assignments by looking at these post-its that people have that it, it may be that there needs to be some sort of prompt to the student about gathering information and stuff like that. So I, I think like the the type of ILO, like, com like communication for me, that was one of the hardest things it was trying to figure out exactly what I wanted to get the student to do, right? Yeah. <laughs> Based on what the rubric was saying, so. No, I, I agree and coming, coming from a similar discipline i i complete i i acknowledge how that can be a struggle especially in in math when you feel like it's like there's the problem and they already start manipulating right away i think it's the identification part that can stand out instead of especially instead of or recognizes especially if a student starts working on a problem and you know that they should be including like the number two and they include the number five it's a horrible example but it's still morning uh, but in terms of talking to your students about this so it might even just be a helpful conversation to talk about relevant information how do you pick out relevant information from a problem versus anything that's irrelevant because i agree with you i think it just depends that's a good point. Thank you, Brian. Amanda, can I share something? Yeah. You know, I have my assignment there, and, and I talked about it. But something that came that I brought up just very briefly in my in our conversation, because it, you know, it's a, mine is a psychology course, so we talk about statistics and means mm -hmm. and modes and all that stuff. But one interesting uh, topic that comes up when I'm talking about it and throughout the course really is kind of the 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 the, the reticence and the fear that students have when it comes to quantitative data. You know. Uh, the, you know the, the mindset you know the mindset mm -hmm. of a student and, and kind of how to address that because you know I bring it up and I say well you know what uh, how many of you like math and of course everybody says like I hate math I'm not good at it and it really is a mindset you know maybe they had a bad experience or something you know so you know for like an instructor I think it's kind of important you know to think about uh, you know uh, how do I address the, their their fear and the, and the mindset because what What's intuitive to you and me may not be intuitive to them. And, you know, it's hard to teach something that's intuitive, you know, uh, yeah. break it down. Anyway, just thought I'd mention that because a lot of my students are like, you have this incredible fear of math, you know, um, when we talk about it, they just don't want to go there. <laughs> yeah. And that's, I mean, that's a real thing I've experienced with students in my classroom too. When I taught freshman algebra, um, mm -hmm. that, that came up a lot. I think, for, for me personally, the best way to try and address that and break down those walls is um, have, have some sort of lead into your key assignment, right? And you probably already do, but maybe there's a way for them to practice the skills in your key assignment in some low stakes areas, something that's not a high stakes assessment, but maybe it's just to start the class or to end the class. They can work with a group member, something that makes them feel a little more confidence to build up that skill level and then they have the key assignment. So I think that I think that's the at least my best way that I've broken down those barriers in the past, but I know that it is hard. I like how geography had put in um, that they give um, information lectures on that topic first. And I think, you know, one thing that I'm just thinking about when we built skills to like build graphs and charts it those kind of skills didn't happen right away so when my students are, are learning, learning a new skill like excel you know it might be good to provide examples on what you're expecting what those graphs should look like you know and say this is what we need this is an important element like this needs to be labeled here this has a label here this is what you put you know your units you want to do this and so kind of teaching them those skills and how to to you know, to kind of maybe even give them some advice on how 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 they can build those skills and 
you know, because I remember it really helped when I would look at like whatever professor their journal articles and what they kind of expected in their 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 graphs. I would look at those as examples because I'm like, that's what they're expecting. You know, some, you know, me, my interpretation of this, but I need to have quality work. But those kind of skills aren't, you know, quick and it kind of takes some prodding and some guidance. A good point. I mean, everybody that's tried to help students with units on a graph, I mean, <laughs> Raise your hand if that has been a struggle. I've I've had to learn how to explain things in a different manner because, you know, we just don't all we don't all think the same. And what I think when I graph something is not what anybody else is going to think. So it's always an interesting facet. Amanda, right quick. Yeah. So, Tony, one of the things that I do on my key assignment as the introduction, right, is I give a little paragraph. The purpose of this assignment is to blah, blah, blah. Right. But then I also tell the students, if you need additional resources, go to chapter two lecture notes, page blah, blah, blah. Go to chapter three in the textbook and read about blah, 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 blah. You know, so I actually give them resources where they can go mm -hmm. to see, OK, this might help me do this key assignment. I don't say this is how you do it right, but right. i say perhaps you might want to check la 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 so. yeah 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 no i that's a good point sarah and, and the, the, nowadays and they're very fortunate to to have all sorts of resources like they can go to youtube and google anything these days and there's all sorts of ways to get at a problem so no yeah that's good i'm you know that's a good idea uh, give them resources Thanks for sharing everyone. Um, I'll just highlight just before we move on. I see that we have a couple things in this Jamboard about case studies, identif identifying information, looking at the research, doing research. Um, I get to read all of these. Ooh, we had two math people in the same room. Identifying key features, identifying the equation. Excellent. Lots of good things up here. Um, so we'll we'll be doing this again for Criterion 2. Um, before I move away from Criterion 1, are there any final thoughts? All right. So our focus is now going to shift from identifying information to can you do something with the information, right? So synthesis. Can, you pro can students process, synthesize, manipulate, data or observable facts. And you notice there's a lot of little boxes here, which means all of these words are in the glossary to help out our students and to help anyone out when they're creating their key assignment. So we've def defined process as a series of actions or operations that lead to a result. Synthesize um, to combine parts or elements to create a whole. And then also an alternative definition to combine ideas or findings to make an overall point. And then manipulates to change, substitute, or rearrange information. So we gave two examples for this one. In science, it could be manipulating a variable in an experiment. And in math, it could be manipulating an equation to solve for a specific value. So there's a lot of different things going on in here in terms of verbs to help um, make this rubric broad enough to apply to many different key assignments. Um, the last word to define would be observable fact which we define as a noted piece of evidence determined using one of the senses of the body, smell, sight, hearing, touch. I can't remember the fifth one right now. Taste, no, I think I already did that one. Um, but th those are our definitions for observable facts and the other verbs. Um, again, they're there to help students as well as to help instructors. So if we're looking at a developing um, performance level, which means the outcome is met, students have met the outcome for EQS. That means they have done all of those three verbs or one of those three verbs to solve the issue or to attempt to get closer to the issue. Um, if they're in the advanced category, the main change is actually just the word skillfully. And we struggled with this one for a little bit in the rubric revision, but we felt that the word skillfully defined as with great ability to do the activity or job well, you'll see the difference between a student that 
could just be going through the motions to solve the problem, whereas someone is going above and beyond to find different facets of the issue, to go further, to push further. Um, and then on the emerging level, the outcome not met, the student did not uh, synthesize, manipulate, or process. Instead, we put that they merely restate data or facts. So instead of interacting with the information, they're just kind of saying the same thing that was given to them. Um, are there any questions about the performance level language or this criterion? Okay, so really we get into a pretty good rhythm at this point in the session because we're going to do the same thing. You're going to go to your breakout rooms. Um, I'll probably leave the 10 minutes this time without the extra time because I know we needed to play around with the Jamboard a little bit um, last time. You do have a different Jamboard for Criterion 2 and it's in the chat right now. The question is very similar to what we saw before. The question is, how does the language or how does the key assignment prompt the students to meet criterion two? So really focus on the language in the rubric. Think about those words, process, manipulate, and synthesize. How does your key assignment ask students to do that? Is it clear to the students what they should be doing? Um, so take some time to think about that with your breakout rooms. Um, are there any questions before I send everyone on their way? Hello. <laughs> hello, hello. So Amanda, one of the things that we found in our group, we're in group six, mm -hmm. uh, is that we use a lot of good verbiage as in construct or define or describe or calculate, right? Identify. Yeah. We use a lot of good verbiage like that. But one of the things that um, we noticed was that mm -hmm. you have to be very explicit to students, especially for EQS, in the units. What type of, like if you give a student, right? If you give students, okay, they have to go find something online, right? You have to be very specific of where they're going to online because there's so many different places they can go to online and find different data right? Mm, yeah. You didn't go to that place or whatever. So you have to be very explicit about where you need them to go online. But then you also need to be very explicit about the units that you want them to use, right? To define yeah. the data or, or whatever, that kind of thing. So. Yeah, that's okay. That's really interesting. I'll start there because I know some of you were coming back to the breakout room. Um, as Sarah and I were talking, let me share the group six um, Jamboard. They were talking about how they use a lot of other verbs to kind of get students to start manipulating, um, synthesizing, and oh, I've forgotten the other word, processing the information, um, which is complete. I mean, that's completely okay, because I know that not like these three verbs are not all encompassing. So if you know that you use different verbs that get students to perform these same skills, that's wonderful. Um, and so I like they're talking about construct, set up and compute. Also, the CDC state maps on salmonella food poisoning. I would never eat things again if I did. That. <laughs> but that's a great assignment. <laughs> it would it would scare me. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that that's a great point that it's not all verbs are the same, but the verbs can get at the same type of um, criteria, the skills and the criteria too. And then what Sarah was saying about the units was just if students are having to look up appropriate numerical data or observable facts, that we need to be clear in what um, our expectation is for the units, um, especially, you know, since we have Imperial and the metric system, that's one hurdle, but <laughs> I'm sure there's numerous other hurdles um, in terms of getting the correct data and the right unit that you're looking for. Uh, thank you for sharing. And then I was checking out, I, you know, I keep, I look at these while you're in the breakout rooms. I'm always just curious what's going on because I'm missing out on those conversations. Um, so I was looking at this uh, group one, breakout group ones, um, post-its and um, I really some of them really stood out to me because I'm I'm coming from a mathematics background so and and physics background so the calculations finding data that part 
I feel like I've practiced a lot in my career, but I liked this one. The students are instructed to use their evidence gathered to create an opening statement to support their stance and then to support the evidence to create supportive facts and support their argument. Uh, I, I mean, I'm not going to put anyone on the spot, but if this was you <laughs> and you would like to share, um, I'd love to hear which class it's for. Anybody? Okay, that's all right. That's all right. That Part of this still justice, doesn't it? A little bit. I, like maybe. Maybe. <laughs> no, Bill's shaking his head. <laughs> well, I thought it was interesting, nonetheless. Whoever posted that, I like that because that is why that is exactly why we put the observable facts. Um, it, it was Maricela. I, I'm getting oh. coffee. I'm getting coffee. <laughs> she was caught. <laughs> Okay, it was Marcella. Okay. Yeah, but I love that because that's a perfect example of how to use observable facts versus numerical data. <laughs> Sorry, Marcella, we called you out while you were getting coffee. <laughs> um, let's see, does anyone else want to share out about Criterion 2 and how they um, talk to it about or how they get their students to perform those actions in Criterion 2? So I do it through um, asking them questions in the assignment, like comparing and contrasting two different graphs that they've created. And then also um, I ask them to analyze a cycle. So it's 400,000 years of data, but like in a small chart. And so um, they have to identify cycles, you know, so um, probably we should teach them what a cycle is and like how to figure that out. <laughs> um, but basically, um, asking those questions in the actual assignment helps them um, guide them to answering those questions. Thank you, Liz. I'll just keep jumping around. I like psychology, talking about the statistics again. Geography. I think it, this is very, that's very similar to what Maricela, or kind of similar in nature to what Maricela had written about synthesizing information from an article and coming up with a um, stance. Ryan, that's from your class, right? Yeah. Yes. I was wondering, is something we're supposed to do to save that? Because I've noticed uh, seeing all the, the rooms up there, rooms four and five, uh, don't have any sticky notes on them. I know we had some sticky notes on. Um, it, it could just be a connectivity issue with, on my end, if I need to refresh it, um, it, oh, you shouldn't I have to typed it in. I'm oh. sorry. I was late. <laughs> That's okay. No, when you type it in, all you have to do is make sure you hit save and then it should pop up. Yeah, and I did that and, you know, and, and it, it popped up and, and then I saw later on in, in our gathering, there were like, like three others sticky notes in there. Uh, but when we come back to the main session, they're not there. So I didn't know for something else we were supposed to do to. Um, to... No, but let me well, check in case. Oh, sorry, Justin, what's up? I was just going to say it's a different board. So did you go to the new link? Because each, yeah. mm -hmm. each criterion has a different jam board. Yeah. So maybe that. Yeah. Well, I had both. I had posted mine in group one, not not changing my group. That's that okay. Was showing up, so I had to delete it from group one and repost it in group three. Okay, and if you want it, you can always. I think the yeah, the editor or anybody can copy and paste. So if that happens again, just so you don't have to retype it, you can double click on the sticky note to copy and paste and put it in a different place. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I know this is maybe a tool that not it's it's an you know, if you've never used it before, I hope you're enjoying it. But I'm sorry, Dale, if your sticky notes are uh -huh. saving. Uh -huh. um, did you how what what is your key assignment like? Oh, what do you uh, my my key assignment is a empirical formula. So I give them this a, a hydrocarbon that's burned and they have the mass of the compound and they get the mass of the carbon dioxide and and uh, water that it makes. And they have to use that information to get the empirical formula. And so one thing that came out in our room is we, th we think that uh, the first criterion and the second kind of merge because, uh, 
you know, they they have they're at the same time they're gathering it, they're putting it into the the formula, into the calculation. I mean, if they if they use the uh, mass of carbon with the atomic weight of hydrogen, they're not going to get the right number of moles. So they have to put the right pieces of information together. So they're kind of gathering it and calculating with it at the same time. That's a great point. And I think I think that will happen in, in several disciplines where you are pulling out the relevant information to plug into a problem that you're trying to solve. And there there's absolutely, I mean, sometimes those lines are blurred and there's nothing we can do to stop that. But I agree with you that the identification piece can happen while students are synthesizing the information as well. So I'm wondering if instead of just letting them, you know, free run with it, where you give them all the information, say now you present, you know, organized calculation leading to the formula, should I break it down for the sake of the rubric, say like step one, which, which mass will you use to find carbon, you know, and then make them specify. Now, now show the calculation. Step two, which mass will you use for hydrogen? And so someone could say, okay, there, here's the uh, identification, you know, here's the synthesis and. Yeah. You know, that, that might make it easier for the, the rater as well uh, mm -hmm. when you have it like that. So I think I'll rewrite that one to break it down. So they have to show it each step. Here's what I'm using for this. Here's what I'm using for this. And here's where I'm doing it. And maybe that'll, that'll help. Yeah, it might help the scaffolding. Those mm -hmm. steps will also kind of, it would probably help your students a lot in terms of knowing what they need to know to continue solving the problem. Um, I had to break down a calculus problem like that because one year I did this horrible, we'll just call it the banana problem. Um, <laughs> and um, it went as wrong as it could have gone. <laughs> um, but then my second year, I realized exactly what I needed to scaffold to help just a little bit in terms of understanding, especially if they're working on it without me being there. That's a great point. <laughs> and thank you so much for sharing, Dale. <laughs> uh, you're welcome. <laughs> um, any other observations about Criterion 2 or discussions that you want to share with the main group? We're doing this is wonderful. I love having time to talk about key assignments like this. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you for having those discussions in your group. Um, I mean, those are the key things. The Jamboard is just there to help you record any discussions so we don't forget when we talk about it later. And everyone will have access to these after the fact, too, if you want to go back and look at what your colleagues have written down. Um, we'll jump into Criterion 3. So criteria three is the conclusion. Can students interpret, analyze, or explain numerical data or observable facts culminating in one or more relevant conclusion? Um, and we, I'm gonna go ahead and just define that word right now. We defined a relevant conclusion as a conclusion that is relative to the original investigative statement. And we included this vocabulary really to help the reviewers more than anything else, um, anyone who's rating in the spring, um, because you'll be able to tell reviewers what that relevant data is in the identification step. What are students supposed to be looking for? So then if we see that they're looking for um, information A, but then by the time they get to the conclusion, they've gone off in this weird tangent and now they're somewhere else completely. They're at step Z, basically. They're not even at step B. They've gone all the way to step Z. Um, that helps the reviewer know that, well, they reached a conclusion, but it was not relevant to that original state, to that original information that they started with in the identification area, the goals of the problem, really. Um, so to start off with developing the outcome mat again, our performance level language says that students should interpret, analyze, or explain data or facts to draw that relevant conclusion. So that's kind of our baseline for students to meet this standard. Um, that's where they're starting. Can they, can they at least get to that conclusion, that relevant conclusion? Advanced, we see the word skillfully come back in, um, which again, skillfully is with great ability to do an activity or job well. And they skillfully interpret, analyze, or explain data or facts to draw a well-supported and relevant conclusion. So that was our probably our biggest um, factor to set aside the advanced category. And well-supported means substantially upheld by evidence or fact. 
facts. So it's not just that they drew the conclusion, they had a lot of information to back it up when they drew the conclusion and it was still relevant. And then last but not least, our, more, our emerging category, they did not interpret, analyze, or explain. And then this last part, and or the conclusion is not relevant. Um, so again, that goes back to, did they continue down the track that you set for them with the identification step in that relevant information and it led them to a relevant conclusion based on that information? Um, I know I've shared this story before, but when I was in high school, I took the tax test and I got a zero on an essay once because um, you can only get a zero if you don't write, which I did not, um, or you go off topic. So that's clearly was my standard. I don't know what I wrote that year, but I just went off on some tangent. You know, it's, it can happen. It can happen. So that's why we included that language in the emer emerging category. So that way if reviewers notice that a student completely went off the concept, they can notate that. Are there any questions about criterion three? All right. Well, this is gonna be our last breakout room of the day. Um, I know that we've been talking about our key assignments for a while now. Thank you for continuing those discussions. Uh, I'll put the last Jamboard link in the chat. Are there any questions before we go into the breakout room? Our conversation this time is about aligning the instructions to criterion three. How does your assignment prompt criterion three? Okay, more comments. Are you ready? I am. You scared me. I looked away for a second and minimized the zoom. <laughs> more comments. What do you have? <laughs> so I was explaining to our group, Amanda, in that criterion number three is probably the most difficult one for raters to figure out if a student has just met or skillfully met. And I was indicating that for EQS especially, we have there's got to be an answer key included. There has got to be. Because for some assignments, for some key assignments, there is a correct answer versus incorrect, right? You either did it right or you did it wrong, so to speak. But then there's also how will a rater figure out Okay, yeah, the student came up with the right answer, but how did they skill did they skillfully do what they needed to do? And in math and in some other sciences, right, disciplines, there are multiple ways you can come up with the right answer. Okay, yeah, they came up with the right answer, but was it skillfully? And so mm -hmm. I think that this criterion is especially important for an instructor to indicate what does a skillful answer look like? How could they cut, could they use this formula? Could they use that formula? You know, the steps and all that. I think that's where it really boils down to, did they just meet it or did they skillfully meet it? Yeah. And I know, I know a lot of people were popping in as Sarah was uh, speaking. Sarah was talking about it, particularly from the Raiders perspective in the spring, how will our Raiders know um, whether a student skillfully solved a problem or if they just stuck to the standard route and solved the problem. Um, so it, it could, it, it would probably be good to include an answer key. I actually know, I've seen many of your key assignments. I think many of you do include an answer key, um, but that could be helpful for our raters. But, and this is, here's the unpopular opinion about EQS. And there's been several discussions on um, state levels because the actual definition of empirical and quantitative skills just says that it results in an informed conclusion. Now, of course we hope that it's correct. Of course we hope that. If the student's analyzing the information how they should, it should come out to a correct solution, but that's not what the state of te Texas is asking us for. It's an informed conclusion. Did the student interact with the material in a way that shows that they are manipulating and analyzing data and developing some sort of conclusion that 
is coherent, I guess we could say, and uses what they collected. So even if they went wrong in step A, but they continued to use that through step B and C, D, and came up with some sort of conclusion based on that, that's still a conclusion. I know it's incorrect, but that's kind of where that line blurs between grading and rating. We're not going to be grading for the correct answer. We're rating to see the process followed, which is still difficult. And I agree that an answer key can still help to show how you could skillfully solve a problem. But at the end of the day, we want an informed conclusion according to THECB. And I know that's tricky because we have to take off the grading hat and say, OK, I might know. They might have said two plus two equals five in the beginning, but I'm just going to go with it. And I know that that five is going to carry through and see what the rest of their analysis looks like. And that is what makes it a really tricky ILO. And especially it's tricky when you have disciplines who know nothing about other disciplines, right? Because I, I know absolutely nothing about computer science, nothing. And if I were to get right to rate something in a different discipline, I would have absolutely no clue. Even I, I, I don't. I is that skillful or not? I, I don't know. I have no clue. I understand what you're saying. Yeah, and that's that is definitely where the cover sheet comes in handy. And we'll talk we'll talk about that before we leave. But that's a it's a great point and a good concern. Um, I did make sure that the raters for EQS are only faculty who teach and assess EQS. But again, I know we have a wide, broad range of subjects and disciplines re uh, represented here. Um, always as a rule of thumb, if you're rating an assignment and you're really not sure if you can rate it or if it, there's information that you're really just not confident on, when we get to the spring, you can always reach out to me too. But I, I know that that's something that comes up often in our process and it's realistic. Um, but we because we have because of the size of our campus, we have to employ all the raters we can. And yeah, it can be tricky. And we'll talk about how we can kind of navigate that in the cover sheet in just a couple minutes. Um, I see a lot of great points for criterion three. Did anyone want to share out any information or any questions that they had while they were talking about it with their group? All right, and in the essence of time, I want to keep us moving forward. Wait, I heard a noise. <laughs> oh, just real quick, I think the whole point of this is to reinforce our students to be critical thinkers, to think for themselves by their observations and experiences, and take it outside of the class and apply it to real life. Definitely, yeah. Um, Amanda, I just yeah. want to say, uh, you know, I kind of had this, I mentioned this uh, in our group session, but the, uh, um, I know we moved towards having just one key assignment, uh, and I was recalling, you know, in the past week we, we would say you could have more than one. If for some reason your problem, I mean your your uh, assignments separate the, uh, the, you know, the criteria. You know, one assignment covers the first two, and another assignment addresses the third. But I know we we kind of collapsed it into one to make it easy for everybody. Um, is that still the case? We just want one assignment, or are we allowed to have more than one assignment if you know if different assignments address different aspects of the learning outcome? Uh, I just I just want to make sure I'm understanding your question, Tony, because you're talking about one ILO having multiple assignments for different criterion. Correct. Okay, I would recommend that it's the same assignment, um, so students can follow the process through. Um, from the first criterion to the final criterion of conclusion. But um, that being said, if you know that more than one of your assignments gets at all three criteria, please use more than one EQS assignment because um, I know that came in handy, for example, in the communication assessment. I had a faculty member reach out to me and said, hey, my student didn't finish their key assignment, but I have this other assignment that aligns with the rubric. Can I submit that? Of course. So if you have another assignment that still aligns to the rubric, by all means, you can have more than one key assignment. But I would recommend just I, I would recommend that all criteria are highlighted in the one assignment. I see. Yeah, because I have one of my assignment probably addresses one and two really well, but but not three. So I think, well, I have one that can, you know, covers 
just three, they synthesize data and come up with a conclusion. So, you know, that's what I was thinking, but I kind of like the idea of just having one assignment to cover all three, it just simplifies the whole thing. Yes. Yes. And it, and it gives them the to pro, it gives them the ability to go through all of the processes that we've identified that go along okay. with EQS. Great question. Thank you. All right. Um, I'll get ready to move us forward. Are there any final questions before we go on or thoughts? <laughs> also, I want to just say some of you started labeling your discipline. That, that I like it. <laughs> it. It made me smile that people were doing that on their own. <laughs> um, all right, these Jamboards, they will be available for all of you to look at later if you just want to go back and take a look at what your colleagues had said. Um, I'm going to start going over the process for the fall. And I saw, I think I saw a question in the chat that I'll get to in just a moment. Um, but the way that our process works is that in the fall, we collect the student work, which then we start calling artifacts as students submit the key assignment. And like I mentioned um, with, with Tony's questions, if you have um, more than one assignment that meets the rubric criteria, um, by all means, use it. And um, if it kind of gives you a buffer if students don't complete the one key assignment. Um, but it's, it's up to you as an instructor what works best for your class. Um, once you collect the student work for assessment purposes, when you submit it to me, you'll remove all identifying student information. Really, that's typically just their name. Um, I'll still ask for their banner ID because it helps me on the back end um, connecting all the information. And then this is what I was referencing earlier is the cover sheet. Let's take a quick second to talk about that. Oh, weird. I... We'll figure this out. <laughs> Updating my browser mid-session? No, Google. I will not. Um, <laughs> okay, so this is the cover sheet. It's in that resources document that I gave you, and you'll receive it um, if a student is in the sample in your course. Um, the way that the cover sheet is made is that you'll say your name, your course information, assignment title, basic kind of identifying information. But then this is the real part where the raters will benefit the most. How does your assignment align to this rubric criterion? Basically, the conversations we just had that you were talking about with each other. How do I ask students to identify? How do I ask students to synthesize? How do I ask them to develop that conclusion? It also could be helpful if you point out the keywords in your assignment where raters might look for students to do this. Like if you know that you have a step-by-step -step assignment and you're like, hey, in part B, that's where students should be synthesizing the information, that helps direct the rater attention to part B to be looking for these, um, the performance level language for synthesis. Same for conclusion. Um, and I think that helps with, Dale, the point that you brought up that identification and synthesis this is, can somehow bleed a little bit together because students are identifying information while they're synthesizing. And that's where you can kind of notate that as well, just say, well, students should gather the information while they're working on the equation for the synthesis. So this cover sheet is crucial. It is what raters see before they do anything else. And really it's probably the only thing they should be looking at because they're trying to see if students reach these criterion based on what you're telling them. Um, you'll also be asked to copy and paste your key assignment instructions into this document, or you can attach it as a separate document. Um, great question, Justin. Justin, I saw what you were saying. Um, it, we actually, Justin was asking about the kind of modality for the key assignment. You can have students submit, honestly, you can have them submit almost anything. It can be a written assignment. You can have them submit a video, um, a presentation even. Um, you can, there's a wide range of what works best, again, because it's up to you guys, what works best for this key assignment. You can submit any type of data that your students are giving you for it. Um, but we should be able to see their thinking. So the only thing that's really off the table here is multiple choice exams or like true false questions, because we can't really see the thinking behind those processes. That's kind of like invisible thinking. <laughs> Um, so I hope that answered your question, but if not, Justin, we can talk, we can talk later. 
Um, so that's the key, that's the cover sheet. Um, you'll submit the artifact and cover sheet with the Dropbox link from me that you'll receive if you have students in the sample. Um, just to give you a timeline of when this should happen, August classes began last week or two weeks ago. Um, census date is 9-7. The assessment sample is created after the census date. So we try and make sure we avoid any like smart drops or withdrawals in that first couple weeks of class. And I work with institutional research to create the sample. So it takes about until late September, early October when they give me the information and I um, disaggregate it for all of our faculty on campus. So you should expect an email from me late September, early October that says, you know, important assessment sample. <laughs> um, and then all artifacts should be submitted to me by the end of, uh, really by the end of December. I put 1216. I think that's the week after finals or the week that finals ends. I'm a little bit lenient on this. So if you need a couple extra days, you can let me know, but I really need it before the end of the fall semester. Um, and as always, anytime you need help, you just reach out. I'm a phone call, an email, an office away, um, and I'm there to help you with whatever you need. Um, with that being said, I think we're, we are done with the pre-norming section. If anybody wanted to stay around to see the results of the critical thinking and teamwork assessment, please hang on the, the Zoom. But if not, I'm going to I'm over here for a second, just so I can see all of your faces. I hope you all have a great weekend, a great Friday. So hang around if you wanna see the results, but if not, no hard feelings, have a great day. Thank you for um, all your participation today. Thank you.